It's good to worship the king. It's good to be thankful. We're in a series called A Thankful Heart. And Luke kind of started us off last week. Pastor Luke kind of launched us into this series. We're going to kind of piggyback a little bit on what he was talking about last week. He was talking about living that life of thanksgiving. I want to I want to just play around with the word today. I'm going to misspell it. I'm the world's worst speller. Uh, anybody who works with me knows that I have my own language. Not only do I misspell words, I actually make words up. I know some of you have heard me do that while I'm preaching. Uh, sometimes I'll make a word up. It's all right. It's, if it's your, it's your sermon, you can make a word up. Uh, I want to misspell a word today on purpose. I want to talk to you about this word, thankful. That's the title of my message, Thank. Full, and, and I'm, I'm putting a hyphen in there, and I'm spelling it with an extra L. I, I know it's wrong, I know, but but I want to talk to you about being full of thanks today. Luke talked last week about that overflowing thankfulness, that generosity, that when the grace flows in, <laughs> and, and we get filled up, then generosity flows out. Why? Because we are so full of God's grace, we're so full of His mercy. How can we not? help but share it with someone else how can we not help but smile and be happy and be alive i'm going to keep doing this until you get with me (laughs) the dictionary says noah webster says that it means thankful with the correct spelling means to be grateful look i love this line impressed with a sense of kindness received impressed Uh, can i tell you something there are some people who give gifts And you're just not very good at it. I just need to break that down for you. Uh, There are some gifts you get and you look at it and you think, well, I'm not that impressed. Uh, I'm a troublemaker by nature. And uh, years ago, I'm talking almost 40 years ago, 30, uh, at least 30 years ago, I uh, was asked to go speak at a church. And um, it's in Connecticut. It doesn't matter where it was. It's Assembly of God Church, so I'm picking on my own denomination. Uh, but uh, the pastor had told me that he had a lot of trouble with his board. The board was very tight, very tight. Uh, in fact, he had wanted to buy some pens like we use in the church, and they'd had a three-hour meeting about it. I think it was $17. And uh, some of you have been on those kind of committees. Anybody been on a committee? There's no committees in heaven. Oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> committees are wonderful if you want to slow something down and get nothing done. Um, and boards aren't far behind it, sorry. Uh, but uh, he had told me that they were super tight and he'd had trouble with them and uh, they were just not generous and they hadn't really blessed him. And, uh, you know, they had just been like a bunch of tight ones, like it was their own money. They felt like it was their money. Every dollar they spent, like it was theirs, not God's. And, and so he asked me to fill in for him. He was out of town and he said, would you mind? Fill? I said, no, I'll go fill in. I was a young kid preacher. And so I went. And I knew some of the board members. One of them actually was related to me. It's a long story, but one of them was actually related to me, and he was the tightest one out of the whole bunch. And, uh, and so uh, after I preached on Sunday morning, they took me in a back room. Uh, like, big deal. They took me in a back room. I thought they were going to, like, the Inquisition, you know. And, and there were four of the board members there, and they said, we thank you for your ministry today. We'd like to give you this honorarium. We'd like to bless you with this. And they gave it to me in an envelope that was open. Like, most times if you go somewhere and speak, they'll give you an honorarium, but they kind of slip it to you. You know, it's kind of a little, you know, they just, you just put it in your pocket and kind of like, you don't want to really get paid, but you want to get paid, you know. <laughs> so, you know, we don't like, if someone comes here, we don't have a lot of guest speakers, but if someone comes here, we try to really bless them, but we don't take them in a back room with a couple of board members and present it to them like it. It's just, the Bible says, the servant is worthy of his honor. But you ought to do it quietly and reverently. So they made a big fuss. I thought, well, if you want to make a big fuss, I'm going to open it. So I opened it up. I remember like it was yesterday. The check was for $25. And on the memo line, it said honorarium. And so I opened it, I looked at it, and I said, oh, well, thank you very much. I said, oh. I said, there's a mistake on here. There's a typo. And they were like, what? The treasurer was there. What? What? Like, I made a mistake on the check. I said, yeah, right here, like on this line, it says honorarium. They said, yeah. I said, there's absolutely no honor in this whatsoever. And if you think that I need $25 from your church, do me a favor. Put this back in your treasury. And you people need how to learn. Not with me, but with your pastor and with other people. You need how to learn to bless somebody when it's time to bless somebody. Don't be cheap in the kingdom. Be blessed in the kingdom. They never asked me back. (laughs) Never, never, never. 
I don't recommend it everywhere you go. I'm not saying that's how you should treat people who give things. But you know and I know that you've been given a gift sometimes and you know when you open it, huh, this was a re-gift. <laughs> I remember when they got this two Christmases ago, they kept it in the closet, now they've given it to me. There are other times when we're given something and like Luke said last week, we open it and we go, what? There's no way, I, I can't receive this, it's too good. Look, I love that. Thankfulness comes when we are impressed with a sense of the kindness that has been received. When we pause and think about what God has done for us, how could you not say, oh, I'm so thankful today. God, you've been so, so good to me. I don't want to give this back. God, I'm going to keep this gift of grace, this gift of your mercy. God, I don't deserve it, but I thank you for it today. How could you not shout hallelujah? How could you not say, look what the Lord has done? How could you stand in church and not sing? You deadbeat. Open your mouth. Lift your hands and give glory. You are on your way to hell. Now you're on your way to heaven. And you can't even sing his praises. Shame on us. Thankfulness. Pleased, relieved, appreciative. A couple of quick slides and then I'll calm down. <laughs> Thankfulness, I believe, is vital to a spiritual, healthy, fulfilled life. When you are not filled with thankfulness, you will never reach who it is or what it is God wants you to be and have. Whatever you want to have or achieve or desire to become, the first step is always thankfulness. The things you appreciate, value, and care for will always increase in your life. You want a better marriage? Start being thankful for your spouse. Not, oh, here she comes, the ball and chain. Start being thankful for your husband. Well, he's kind of a... I know, but can you just be thankful? Uh, the things you appreciate, value, and care for will increase in your life. Listen, being sincerely thankful for what you already have will, I believe, propel you spiritually, mentally, and physically towards greater blessing and fulfillment in your life. You should have took a picture of it. Listen, when you live and act with thankfulness... It keeps you focused on abundance rather than on lack on lim and limitation. Think about it. When you're thankful and appreciative for what you have, your mind becomes occupied with, po with positive thoughts. I am blessed. I am on my way to heaven. I am <laughs> in a good relationship. Listen, by contrast, when you are bitter, resentful, and apprehensive about what you don't have, it focuses your mind completely on lack and limitation. One more quick slide, listen. Thankfulness, I believe, can transform common days into thanksgiving, turn routine jobs into joy, and change ordinary opportunities into heaven-assigned blessings when you walk into it with thankfulness. Oh, I got to go to that meeting. Oh, oh let's go. How do you think that meeting's going to turn out? Man, I, God, I thank you that I get to go to this meeting. Uh, some of the people in here are going to drive me nuts, but you know what, God? I thank you for my job. I thank you that I got to drive here today. I thank you that I'm still breathing. I thank you I'm not going to the doctor's office. I'm going to a meeting. Thank you, Lord, for this meeting. I promise you the meeting's going to go better. The idiots will still be there. Your board is still going to be there. That board is still there all these years later. It's not about changing people, it's about changing you. I will be thankful for what God has done. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I don't like preachers who don't have a text. I've already talked too long with that one. I like to start out from God's word, but I wanted to get those things off my chest. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says this, But we have this precious treasure, <laughs> the good news about salvation. In unworthy earthen vessels of human frailty. The King James calls it jars of clay. I didn't know this. I don't know if you know this or not, but that's what heaven calls you. You are a jar of clay. 
Turn to the person that you love right now and say, did you know you're a jar of clay? Did you know you're a jar of clay? I know some of you are saying, yeah, this guy's just a mug. Uh, he's not a jar, he's just a mug. We hold within us this precious treasure. Where is it? Within us. It's in your clay. It's in your vessel. So that the grandeur and the surpassing greatness of the power will be shown to be from God. His sufficiency and not from ourselves. It goes on to say we are pressured in every way. Hedged in but not crushed. Perplexed, unsure of finding a way out but not driven to despair. Hunted down and persecuted, but not deserted. Never standing alone. Struck down, but never destroyed. Always carrying around in our bodies the dying of Jesus. So that the resurrection life of Jesus may also be shown in our bodies. Did you know that with your face you can tell somebody about Jesus? It's like this. Hello. Did you know that with your attitude, with your body language, you can tell somebody about Jesus? You can walk into a sad and depressed situation and you can bring the peace of the Lord into that moment. You can walk into a, a difficult time when people are distressed and, and broken and you can somehow bring the joy of the Lord with you into that brokenness. Why? Because we carry it around inside us. I read something a week or so ago. It actually triggered this whole sermon. So here goes. It's goofy, but I love it. Uh, what I read said this. You're, you're holding a cup of coffee. Some of you saw this. You're holding a cup of coffee. And, and, and you got your nice hot coffee in there, and, and you're just going along, just waiting for it to cool down, and, and, and someone bumps into you, and, as they do sometimes in life, and they bump into you, and hot coffee spills everywhere, you know, on the carpet, on your lap, on people around you. Oh! And, and so the person who told this story, they said, why did the coffee spill? Why did the coffee spill? Well, duh, because somebody bumped into me. Someone nudged me. Someone pushed me. I don't know who it was. Somebody in the crowd, they, they bumped me. And, and I love this guy's a great thinker. He said, well, I, I like your answer and it's a good answer, but it's not the real answer. The real answer is why did the coffee spill? Here's the answer. Because you had coffee in your cup. If you had had tea in the cup, you would have spilled tea. If you had iced tea in there, you would have spilled iced tea. Why did you spill coffee? Duh, because there was coffee in your cup. Whatever you have inside you is going to spill out when you get bumped. Listen, when life comes along and shakes you, which it will, <laughs> whatever is inside you will come out. It's easy to fake it on Sunday. Ta-da! That's what we're doing today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. <laughs> on the way here in the car, you're like, shut up! <laughs> it's easy to fake it until you get rattled. So we have to ask ourselves, what's in my what is in my jar of clay? When life gets tough, what will spill out of me? When my wife frustrates me, not mine, but yours. <laughs> when kids pressure me, when work squeezes me, what comes out of me when I'm shaken? The answer is, is we're all going to be shaken and whatever is in you is going to come out. So the answer is, why would you spill the coffee? The answer is, is because you had coffee in your cup. Life is going to squeeze you, and if what comes out is, oh, my life is so hard, I don't know, I can't go on, guess what? That's what was inside you. That was there before this problem. The problem only squeezed out what was already there. So let's replace what's there, and let's put some joy, thankfulness, kindness, understanding, gratefulness, peace, and humility Let's get rid of the anger, the bitterness, the harsh words, the bad reaction. And you and I get to choose what we put in the cup. Just like when you go to Starbucks. I know everybody's upset. There's no, no Christmas cups again. When you go to Starbucks, unless you're one of those banning Christians. <laughs> leave your Chick-fil-A in the car. Go get your Starbucks. 
When you go to Starbucks, guess what's in the cup? It's what you tell them. Now, I'm not a big Starbucks. I, I don't go there. I, I used to go there years ago, but it just, it's too much money. It's nuts. Plus, I just can't keep up with that whole caramel latte, mati, maki, uni, uni, wachi, uni. You know. <laughs> Grande, la. You know. I'm like, can't you just speak English? We're in America. Large, medium, small. <laughs> what's a tall? I, a tall? I've never had a tall in my whole life. I order a tall every time just because I've always wanted to be one. They call out, Mark, tall. I'm like, wanted to answer that my whole life. You tell them what you want in the cup, and then they ask your name. Can we have a name for the cup? I usually have fun and give them a wrong name, but that, that's another whole thing. I make them call out silly things. But anyways, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what it is in church. I, I can't say it in church. But anyway, <laughs> I used to work at a shop. We used to get on the PA system. Mr. Allen Wrench, Mr. Allen Wrench, will you please come? <laughs> Next time you go to Starbucks, tell them that's your name. Allen Wrench, that's how they call it. Allen Wrench, Allen. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, that was a clean one, I could tell you in church. Anyways, uh, you get to pick what's in the cup, and then they put your name on it. And can I tell you something? You get to pick what you put in your cup today, and you get to put the name on it. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and guess what? If you bump me, if you squeeze me, if you push me the wrong way, this is what's going to come out. Not anger, not frustration. In the traffic. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, I got a car. Thank you, Lord, I got a job to go to. <laughs> I'm not going to post a picture. Look at this blankety blank traffic. And that's on Sunday morning in the church parking lot. Anyway, listen. <laughs> One more verse of scripture in Luke chapter 6. It says this, there is no good tree which produces bad fruit nor on the other hand a bad tree which produces good fruit for each tree is known and identified by its own fruit the intrinsically good person produces what is good and honorable and moral out of the good treasure stored up in their heart and the intrinsically evil person produces what is wicked and depraved out of the evil in their heart for their mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart Whatever I put in my cup is going to come out when I get pushed, when I get pressured, when I get sick, when I get anxiety, when, I, when life squeezes me. Ooh, I, you can't make something else come out. <laughs> ooh, I'm in trouble. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. You, you haven't worshipped God in months. That's not going to come out of your mouth. Uh, listen, thankfulness, I believe, is a force. It, it is more than just an attitude. It, it is a lifestyle, a way of life. It is a way of looking at things. It is impossible to be too thankful throughout life if you're a Christian. I know life is hard. I know you got troubles. I know you got difficulty. I know, I know you got bad news. Yeah, me too. But guess what? We still got lots to be thankful for in the midst of it all. Amen? Amen. Keep your phone out. Listen, living a life without thankfulness is to live lacking in love and passion. I'm... I'm Jason yells at me when I write like this. He says, Mark, you gotta, you, you got to say it plainer. I, I don't know any other way to say these things. So uh, take a picture and digest this all week. Listen, hope without thankfulness lacks the power to birth real change. Faith without thankfulness has no lasting strength. Praise without thankfulness is a sham. And worship without thankfulness will always be weak. Every virtue, every virtue in your life that is separated from thankfulness is damaged and will limp along the spiritual road of your life, maimed, crippled, never bringing to bear its true value into your life. Your worship will never give you what God wants you to get through your worship if you are not thankful in your worship. Your praise, your joy, your love, your marriage, nothing, nothing works right if you extract thankfulness from it. It cripples any virtue that you have, and it will cripple any relationship you have without thankfulness. If you're not thankful for your job, I'm telling you, your job will stink. If you're not thankful for your job, you'll end up hating your job. If you're not thankful for a relationship, that relationship will sour. If you're not thankful for your kids, <laughs> your kids will drive you crazy. That's what kids do. 
If you're not thankful for your grandkids, they'll drive you bonkers. That's what grandkids do. But when you add thankfulness to the mix, everything comes to its rightful place. So, can I just give you four or five facts about thankfulness? They're things I've learned throughout my life. It's not a deep spiritual message today. Uh, we've been through a hard and difficult series. I thought it would be just a time to just fill you up today with some thankfulness. Because here's the truth. Over the next bunch of weeks, and, and that's why Luke started where we started last week. Here's what I'm going to tell you. You're going to get bumped a lot in the next couple of weeks. In the mall, at the store, in life, at work, you're going to get pushed. You're gonna, let's, let's fill up with thankfulness. So, so watch this. I, I'll go bum, bum, bum. Well, not really. It'll be like bum, bum, bum. More like that, but we'll, we'll get there. Aren't you thankful you're here today? Uh, see, if you come to church without thankfulness, you'll hate, oh, is he done? I can't believe how long he talks. It's, it's not my fault. You don't have any thankfulness. I'm squeezing you a little bit. We're going a little bit over. Oh, the parking lot's going to be, that's what's in you. It's not my fault. You're a jerk. Listen. <laughs> uh, if you're a visitor, I, I apologize. Uh, here's what I believe. I believe, number one, that thankfulness is a learned attitude. I, I don't have time to read it today. When you go home, read Luke chapter 7. Luke spoke at length about this last week, so I'm just going to touch on it today. It's the story of a Pharisee who invites Jesus to his house and a woman comes. Luke referenced it last week. She weeps at the feet of Jesus. She wipes his feet with her hair. She anoints his feet. And the Pharisee says in his heart, if he was really a religious leader, he would never let this woman anywhere near him because she's such a vile sinner. Everybody knows that. And Jesus knows his thoughts and says to him, you don't even understand. And he says to him in uh, verse 46, he says, Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Thankfulness is not an immediate attribute of the human heart and spirit. And I know some of you are saying, oh, you know, no, yes it is. No, it isn't. Have children and you will know that it isn't. You never have to teach your children to take. My grandkids come over every Saturday morning for French toast with maple butter and maple syrup and powdered sugar. And we slap that powdered sugar on pretty thick. Yesterday, Noni made French toast in the shape of Christmas trees. I've never seen her so excited about cooking. Our stove doesn't go on a lot. But she was cutting out Christmas trees yesterday. And we had whipped cream and sprinkles. I didn't care. They were going home in an hour. What do I care? Brody opened his mouth and I shot him with the whipped cream. And uh, my grandson loves French toast, eats it up like a champ. My granddaughter, not so much. I got a tricker. You know, you got to do the old, this piece is mine. Don't eat that piece. That's the one I'm going to have next. And as soon as they think it's yours, look, Papa, I took yours. What a wonderful thing to teach children. <laughs> if you want to be happy, steal someone's food off their plate. Awesome. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that you don't have to teach her that. That is intrinsically fun for her. To what? To take which doesn't belong to her. I love her dearly, but she is the spawn of Satan. <laughs> As we all are. The Bible says we're born and shapen in iniquity. And when my wife cooks the bacon, <laughs> microwaves the bacon, <clears throat> <laughs> uh, Brody and I get a piece Harper loves bacon she will eat bacon till it comes out her ears and when my wife puts it down we all take a piece of bacon and we say oh thanks Noni for the bacon we hold it up we say thanks for the bacon Noni we love bacon we laugh and while Harper is eating a piece of bacon and we're all saying great bacon her other hand will come out and she will take another piece of bacon so she has two pieces of bacon And when that process is happening, do you know what I have to do as a grandfather? I got to say, hey, 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 what do you say to Noni for making breakfast? Oh, thanks, Noni. 
you have to remind people to say thank you. It's not in us by our nature. We need to put it in through learning to do it, even as adults. Some of you need to get slapped. Some of you, I've, I've, I've been with Christians in restaurants and, and you talk to waiters, you don't even say please or thank you. Uh, uh, well, I tip him. Th that gives you a reason to be rude? Do you know how wonderful it is to say to a waiter, would you like something to drink? Oh, I'll, I'll, have a, I'll just have water. Thank you very much. It's not hard to say thank you. Or you can just say, water. <laughs> Stop. Watch yourselves. Watch yourself. I've been with, I can't tell you how many people I've been with. They don't say please and thank you to waiters. And then you tip like, ooh, I left 15%. Ooh. Ooh. I know some of you struggle giving God 10%, so it's hard to give a waiter 20%. I, I know, I know. Oh, I'm having fun with you today, aren't we? Listen, you can take things for granted or you can take them with gratitude. The choice is entirely up to you. You can take things for granted or you can take them with gratitude. The option in that is still up to you. It's entirely up to you. Someone blesses you, man, thanks. Appreciate that. That was very kind of you. I've noticed what you've done. Did you know that your gratitude is the gift that you give back to a giver? Did you know that? That's what they're looking for. That's all they're looking for. It's not, it's not that they're looking for it, but that, that's what our gratitude is. It's our gift back to the person who has blessed us. When you don't say thank you, doesn't that drive you nuts when people don't say thank you? I get in trouble with my wife sometimes because I like to open the door for people. So we'll go somewhere, I'll open the door, and people walk through, and they say nothing. I don't care if it's a woman or a man. They, I hold the door open, they walk right through. I go, you're welcome. <laughs> My wife says, stop, shh. Now, if I open the door and a great big, you know, muscle-bound guy goes through, I don't really say, you're welcome. <laughs> I say, honey, tell him, tell him, tell him. <clears throat> In 1856, I know, long time ago, back when my dad was in high school, uh, in 1856, in Medford, New Jersey, a little boy was born. His name was Johnson Oatman. You don't know who he is. It doesn't matter. I didn't know who he was. Uh, he grew up in church. His dad was a pastor, and he grew up in church. His dad was a great singer. His dad had a great voice, and he would love to stand near his dad and listen to him sing. At the age of understanding, he accepted Christ. He became a believer, followed in his dad's footsteps. His dad was actually a businessman as well. They had a mercantile business and were very, very successful in mercantile and in the insurance industry. And later in life, he felt like God had called him, and so he, he went into ministry, but he never gave up the business. He felt like if he had the business, he didn't need to worry about income from the ministry. He's a great guy. I love this guy. <laughs> and, and, and so he had a very successful business career, but he was also a, an itinerant pastor, and he would preach at different churches around in New Jersey uh, all through the late 1800s. Uh, a little later in life, he felt like he could actually write a song, and so he wrote a song. He wrote a hymn, and then he wrote another one, and then he wrote another one. Uh, by the time he passed away, he wrote 5,000 hymns. Many of them, if you're an older saint, you would know some of them. One of my favorite that he wrote says this in the chorus. Count your blessings, name them one by one. <laughs> Count your blessings. See what God has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God hath done. See, friend, you got to count them to see them. If you're not counting them, you're not going to see them. So you have to count your blessings, and you got to name them one by one. Why? Because thankfulness is a learned attitude. It's, it's amazing to me about humanity, but we tend to be thankful in reverse proportion. Watch what I mean. We tend to be thankful in reverse proportion. By that I mean this. If you find a man who is hungry, who hasn't eaten in a few days, and you give him a piece of bread, he will fall at your feet and thank you. But if you find a man who sits every night at a table served by waiters and waitresses and eats anything he wants and fares on the best food, you'll find a man who oftentimes forgets to even say grace. We are thankful in the sometimes in reverse proportion. Sometimes God's got to let us go through a few things so that we remember to be thankful. It's a learned attribute. Let's learn to be thankful today. Amen? Uh, a couple more quick things. Watch this. 
I believe the thankfulness is actually magnetic. It, it just attracts more of whatever it's focused on. If you're thankful for your job, here's what I believe. You'll get promoted in that job. Not, not overnight, but, but here's what I believe. If you work at McDonald's, great place to get a first job if you're a young person in America. If you're working at McDonald's and you're making french fries and all you do while you're making them is, I can't believe i got to do this. I go home stinking like french fries. I hate this job. I hate what I do. I, I got news for you. That job is going to peter out after a while and you're going to go do something else. And the rest of your life, you're not going to accomplish much. I'm just telling you. But if you're thankful for making french fries and you make them better than anybody else, and when that thing goes beep, 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 you pull. <laughs> you put that salt. Ah, these are the best french fries because I made them. I've joked with you about it before. You work at Subway and your only job at the end of the line is to cut that sandwich right through. And I've been there to Subway. And first of all, they don't get it half. It's like a three-quarter sandwich. Like your only job is to hit the middle of this 12-inch grinder, and you're over here at four inches. What? And then, and then don't you hate when you get home and you unwrap it, and you go to pick it up, and they didn't cut through the bottom layer of the bread? Are you kidding? That's your only job. They don't, let you do, they don't let you touch the money. You don't build it. All you do is cut it in half, and you can't go all the way through for Jesus. See, I just believe if you can cut that sandwich all the way through and you can make the best french fries, here's what I believe. I believe that in two years you can be the manager of that subway and in ten years you could own a subway. Why? Because thankfulness is magnetic. It brings to you the things that you are thankful for. Acknowledging the good that you already have in your life is the foundation for all abundance. Acknowledging the good that you already have. That, that is worth $500 right there. Acknowledging the good that you already have in your life is the foundation for all abundance. I, I got a bunch more and give me five minutes, I'll be done. Listen, thankful people are always joyful people. <laughs> you cannot be thankful and miserable. I'm just, I'm just telling you, you can't be. You can't be thankful and, and be depressed. You can't be thankful and be sad. How are you? Oh, praising the Lord. So great to be alive today. It's just, it's an oxymoron. It just doesn't work. It, it doesn't mean that people who are joyful or are Christians are free from stress or heartache or difficulty, but rather that they have chosen to focus on the wonder and the miracle of blessing instead of what they're going through. Happiness comes when we stop complaining about all the troubles... <laughs> that we have and begin to offer thanks for all the troubles that we don't have. If you concentrate on what you don't have, here's what I'm going to tell you, you'll never have enough. <laughs> oh, I wish I had more joy. I wish I had more peace. I wish we had more love in our relationship. I wish we had better communication. Here's what I'm telling you. As long as you keep saying those things out loud to each other and to the people around you, that you'll never have those things. In fact, they will begin to diminish. Because just as I believe thankfulness is a magnet, I believe unthankfulness is a reverse magnet. It demagnetizes you from those things. Thankful people are always joyful people. I'm sorry, you're going to hear the whole hymn. I, I, I don't care if you never heard it, but if you're an old saint, you'll love it. Every verse fits. Watch this. Listen. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy that you have been called to bear? Then count your blessings and every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. Why? Because thankful people are joyous people. We have been cleansed from sin. We have, we were, we have been cleansed from sin and we are now clothed with praise. Uh, number three, number four, I don't know what the number is. Thankfulness is created by focus. Thankfulness is created by focus. I've already said it. I've got to diminish what isn't and what don't look at that and look at what I have. Whatever I focus on, that's what's going to get bigger. That's what's going to seem larger. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, it says this, When you have eaten and are satisfied, this is about the children of Israel going to the promised land. He says, You shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commandments and his judgments his precepts and his statutes, which I have commanded you this day. Watch, watch. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and lived in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply, and all that you have increases, then your heart will become 
lifted up by self-conceit and arrogance, and you will forget that the Lord, your God, is the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, into the place where you are now. We have a tendency to forget. We need to focus on what God has done. It births thankfulness. Charles Spurgeon said, if we only think, we shall begin to thank. <laughs> if we only think, if we just count our blessings. Uh, listen, friend, sometimes we find it hard to magnify God. I believe it's, it's hard for us to magnify God when we're trying to magnify self. <laughs> when we are self-centered, self-focused, self-absorbed, it's kind of self-pity. It's hard to magnify God. My friend, Mr. Oatman said, when you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings that money cannot buy, your reward in heaven, nor your home on high. Friend, I don't know where your life is at, and I don't know what you're going through, but I promise you this, don't focus on your lack, focus on your reward. Don't focus on what you're going through, focus on where you're going. Amen? A couple of quick ones, watch. Uh, thankfulness is required, I believe, for entering the presence of God. Can I just leave that with you? You, just, you can't even come into his presence without it. Psalm 100 says, enter his gates with a song of thanksgiving. You've got to let go of all your negativity and say, man, I want to come into his presence. You cannot come into his presence full of bitterness and woe. He just, I mean, just in, in your life, don't, don't you get frustrated being around people who are always negative? And then they invite you out again. Can you come over our house again? No. No. You almost killed me last time. I spent two hours with you. They're like vacuum cleaners. They should get a t-shirt that says Hoover Christians. They suck all of the joy out of your life. Every time you're around them, everything's a problem. How you doing? Not good. How you feeling? Bad. Want to go out again? No. Listen, it, listen I, I think thankfulness is required to enter into each other's presence. It's certainly necessary to enter into the presence of the Lord. Three more quickly, watch. Thankfulness should occur because of the goodness of God, not because of perfect circumstances. These are just things I've learned throughout my life. I said they're not deep spiritual truths. They're just things I've learned. Thankfulness should occur because of the goodness of God, not because of perfect circumstance. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 says, In every situation, no matter what the circumstance, be thankful and continually give thanks, for this is the will of God. It's not about what I'm going through. It's not about whether I'm on the mountaintop or in the valley. I got to learn to be thankful all the time. Amen, saints? Amen. Amen. I'll get you. Mr. Oatman said, when upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, guess what? Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. I love this line. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. When I, when I understand that it isn't about my circumstances, it's about who God is. So in spite of my circumstance, I can still give thanks. Two more, I'll let you go home, and you'll be thankful. <laughs> Thankfulness occurs when you begin to remember the good things that God has done for you. Write it down. It occurs when you begin to remember. He said, I will solemnly remember the deeds of the Lord. I will wholeheartedly remember your wonders of old. Some of you have been saved a long, long time. I've been on the way a long time now. Man, I can remember some awesome things God has done. Some of you are brand new Christians. For you, your stories are new. They're just, you don't have to go back far. It was last year, last month. Pastor, God touched my grandfather. God blessed me. God saved me. Get excited about these things and remember. And finally today, and I really will let you go home, thankfulness occurs when you replay those memories of God's blessing in your life. I guess it's a part of hitting 60, but you replay a lot of stuff. Um, it's fun, because at my age, you know, they're like new movies. <laughs> Some of them are in black and white, but uh, I colorize them now. I, I got a new filter, so I, I, I colorize them. You need to remind yourself that God is a good God. He is a powerful God, a loving God. He has brought us this far. He's taken us through the fire and through the, blood, through the flood. We have been purchased with the blood of his precious son. He's preserved you through every false accusation and every hater that's ever come against you. You're still going on. Hallelujah. The devil has not won. He has walked in when other people have walked out. We are serving a miracle-loving, powerful God. 
And if nothing else ever occurred in your life, God has been good. Henry Emil said, thankfulness is the beginning of gratitude. Gratitude is the completion of thankfulness. Thankfulness may consist merely of words. Gratitude is shown in acts. How can I show God that I'm grateful this week? So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged. God is over all. Count your many blessings and angels will attend. Help and comfort give you all to your journey's end. Just just count your blessings. Amen? I I, I skipped a slide and I, I just, you don't need the slide. Can I just say this? Part of your homework this week is to write a note of thanks to someone that you are grateful for in your life. Think of somebody right now that you're grateful. It could be your spouse. I don't care. Every once in a while, I send my wife a note. Do you know what I do? I I write it. I I put a stamp on it. I send it in the mail. And and then four days later, and it's amazing how many times it'll arrive just when I'm in trouble. It's like God has been, God has provided. He said, before you ask, I have sent the answer. Send a note. Have you ever, do you still write notes to your spouse? Oh, I leave them in the car. No, mail it. Mail it. Let her get it in the mail. Wow, look at this. Send somebody this week who bless you. Here's what's going to happen. When you begin to think of somebody that you owe thanks to, here's what's going to happen. While you're writing those words on that card, please, listen, I love you. Do not send a text or a stinking email. Get a piece of paper with a pen, with your own hand. Write in words. Hey, I was in church on Sunday and the pastor asked me to write a note. Do you know what? Uh, uh, You were my high school teacher and I just want to say thanks. You were my Sunday school teacher when I was a kid. You led me to the Lord 10 years ago. Thank you. Right? Here's what happens when you write things like that on paper. You remember. It's as good for you as it is for them. So, get your phone out. Listen, you must get over your bashfulness. It's time to shout out thankfulness. It's downright scandalous. It may even be blasphemous to remain passionless. Your ungratefulness may have caused a callousness of heart and a paralysis of praise. But your abstinence from thanksgiving must come to an end. God's overwhelming extravagance, His miraculous, magnanimous goodness should spark unanimous gratefulness. We will sing the praises of our King. He is worthy of our thanks. We are blessed. We will count our blessings this week. We'll remember to be grateful for all that God has done for us. Amen, saints? On the app, if you're brave enough, there is the Antichrist to this message. (laughs) On the app today, I share with you about nine facts about unthankfulness and what it'll do to your heart. It's worth reading. It's worth taking a look at. Can I say one more thing before I pray? Next Sunday we have an intentional focus. And so I'm telling you about it. I want you to pray about it. I want you to work at it. We've looked at being filled up with thanks. Today we're learning more of this thankfulness. We will speak next Sunday morning on the power of thankfulness to actually change our hearts and our minds. In that message next week, there will be an old-fashioned gospel call for salvation. So if you, do not, if you know someone who is not saved, who has drifted away from the Lord, who is not as close as they should be, they're backslidden, they've never been saved, Next Sunday is the Sunday to invite them. Now, I've prayed over it. I've put the message together. It's your job to bring your unsaved friends. So you need to think of somebody right now. I, I'm going to invite them. I'm going to bring them. I'm going to bring somebody. Who could I invite? Who could I bring to God's house next week so they could hear the power of thankfulness and what it could do in their lives? Father, I ask you, God, that you would move in the midst of your church and fill us up with thankfulness. God, when we get bumped, when we get pushed this week, Would you help us to spill out, not coffee, but would you help us to spill out the joy of the Lord and to someone's heart and to someone's life? Touch us with this truth today, God. And then, Father, we begin even now to pray for next Sunday that, God, you would move by your Holy Spirit and draw into this place, God, people who do not know you, who are far from you, who haven't walked with you, haven't been in church for a long time. God, as we invite them, would you go before us and help us pay them, Uh, in debt themselves to us, God, whatever we have to do, God, we're going to bring somebody to the house of God next week. And we ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you.